As, as you all know, um, I'm going to talk about development and economic state. Before that, um, a quick apology for me for our long, relatively long period of science. That was because we had January exams, um, and we weren't sure whether the 12th had January exams. I know Chris had microeconomics, but I wasn't sure about the rest of you. So, um, sorry about the period of silence, but um, it was kind of necessary. So, hopefully, next term uh, we'll be getting some external speakers in, which Keegan is. Um, taken care of um, and he'll inform you about that okay. uh, shortly yeah on the facebook page um so an, a, an introduction to development economics um i thought this map might be quite useful um to look at um just as uh, just as an introduction to development and how i perceive development and how i would quite like you to perceive development by the end of the lecture this map shows um, the countries or has expanded the countries whose population um principally live on under a dollar a day. So predictably, India and China are um, massive, with Saharan Africa also quite big, um, and the UK and the United States um, and Australia very, very small. But the point about this map that I want to take is that what, what I'm really not going to talk about today, I, I, I'm not going to talk about how awful poverty is, because I assume that you all know that the, the internet and news it is it as, as it is will show you how bad poverty is, and you can empathise with awful disease and uh, awful hunger probably. Um, and, and just as you can't see, say, the Himalayas um, on, on India, you can't see the Nile in Africa, um, this doesn't show you anything about poverty other than it really exists. Um, and it won't tell you uh, why it exists, how, how it came about, how we can try to solve it, which is what development economics is about and has been about for over 100 years. So in this lecture, I'm going to be trying to show you uh, the cartography of development economics, as it were. Um, um, first off, I'm going to be focusing on modern development economics, um, which, is, um, which focuses on um, the West, um, why the West don't give more, perhaps why we should give more. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to give you quite a persuasive moral case for us giving more money, um, more resources. And then the second half will be much more useful for those wanting to study scientific economics at university, because it'll be focusing on what we call traditional development economics, the period from 1920 to 2000. Um, I plan to talk for about 45 minutes, uh, 50 minutes. Um, if you have any questions at any time, uh, just interrupt me, or if you have a problem with what I'm saying, just interrupt me um, in any case. So having, having slated the map um, as, 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 as a methodology, it might be useful to see the other end of the scale um, with countries whose population uh, live principally on over $200 a day, so the United States is big, Europe is massive, um, with China, and much of the southeast continent, um, absolutely tiny with, it's quite interesting that Latin America is, is almost the same size as it was in the previous picture, it's, it's a bounce in the middle, which should tell you something about its economic progression. Um, now, just by way of a secondary introduction, how I think we should approach development economics, um, I just want you to consider this little scenario um, and what you would do and uh, how um, this matters to development economics. So on, on your way to school, I don't, I don't know what sort of imaginary world this is where you pass a pond on your way to school, but you do. And um, you pass it every day. And on one day you find um, a young child flailing about and they will stay up right and walk out of the pond. Now that's difficult because you've got new shoes on um, and, and, and new trousers. So if, it, if you tr try to wade in, then you know, you're going to ruin your new shoes and your new trousers. But on the other hand, you might die if you don't. Now, assuming that this child is not Robert Colby, or Roy <laughs> Welsh, um, what do you do? Um, now, you're saying to me, well, this is obvious. Of, of course you should wade in um, and save the child. But in fact, there are instances in, uh, in which people haven't waded in and saved the child. Um, you know, if we take Jordan Lyons, um, who was 10 years old in Manchester in 2007, he fell into a pond three feet deep and two police officers came across him and did not jump in because they weren't trained to. Um, so there, there are instances in which uh, we, we can say, well, that's ridiculous that you didn't save the child. And what I want to explain to you is why it's ridiculous that we don't save the 10 million children who die each year, according to UNICEF, because of avoidable causes definitively related to poverty. Um, it's as a Ghanaian said to a World Bank researcher in 2010 that take the death of this small boy this morning, for example. The boy died of measles. We all know he could have been cured at the hospital, but the parents had no money, and so the boy died of slow and painful death. Not of measles, but of poverty. The cost to bring a vaccine to that boy would have been a hundredth of one cent, one American cent. Um, 
if, if you've worked out the economies of scale for the Ghanaian population. It's not a lot. And what I'm going to be arguing um, secondarily is that um, it's not so much different that these 27,000 deaths per day are not so different morally as you walk walking past 27,000 ponds each day when you walk to school and seeing 27,000 children die. Um, it just, that it happens geographically and in other places almost immaterial. And I'll be trying to explain why that's immaterial. So we see these statements all the time that um, you know, at least 80% of human lives live on less than $10 a day and that nearly a billion people enter the 21st century unable to sign their name or read a book. But the sad thing is, th these phrases become hackneyed, that is that they become tight for overuse, which is sad, I think, because if they're being overused, they've obviously been around for a while. And the longer that these statistics remain relevant, the sadder that is, because that shows that, that we can't redistribute resources in the way that we might otherwise do, which might otherwise be more effective. So. If, if there's one message that, that, that you take away, it's that if you want to be a serious economist, you can't neglect development economics. Um, and it's for this simple reason. Um, if we can't find an equilibrium um, for um, the world economy, that, that is the most basic definition of economics, is the allocation of scarce resources to human infinite wants. And the broadest context we can apply that to is the entire world. If we can't find an equilibrium for that, we might find that there's no equilibrium, fair, stable equilibrium for individual economies, which will affect us. So uh, I think that's probably quite an important um, sentiment to carry through. And, ju and, and just like these, I mean, these are posters that we often see for poverty. Um, but like the map, they don't actually show you anything apart from that poverty exists and just give some money, get, you know, you know, use that consciousness to just give some money, perhaps redistribute a bit of your income, um, a ten thousandth of your annual income to, um, to poverty. It doesn't show you why poverty exists. And I think, um, you know, this is the only probably political thing I'm going to say. Um, Slavoj Sl Sl Zizek, who's a Slovene philosopher and cultural critic, quite important in Marxist circles, says this about uh, posters and, and the way that we imbibe news about poverty. When we're shown scenes of starving children in Africa with a call for us to do something to help them, the underlying ideological message is something like don't think, don't politicise, forget about the true causes of their poverty, just act to contribute money so you will not have to think. Development economics is about thinking about development because some of the problems you come across are absolutely insoluble um, and will need um, decades, um, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years to solve. The, the, this is not the same as normal economics, and this is what makes it so fascinating. It's that actually, in um, a developing country, you're talking about a single macroeconomic variable, like inflation, literally changing um, in infant mortality rates, or literally mattering whether um, a, a vaccine reaches the right people. If I raise interest rates in the UK, then it is, it's not very likely that infant mortality rates are going to be affected very heavily by that. So it's, it's a fascinating study in seeing how macroeconomic variables absolutely affect your average person's life that we don't often see in the West. So it's also quite a good thought experiment. So it, it may be fruitful to just start at the developed end um, of development economics, which is the modern end. There's a lot of sociological research going into this about why we don't give more. Well, why don't we have more of a moral incentive when we're walking past 27,000 ponds each day, um, knowing that 27,000 children die, but why don't we do anything about it? I'm going to put three reasons to you today. Um, the first um, is um, the identifiable victim, the identifiability of who is in poverty. And sociolo sociologists wanted to find out what triggers generous responses to poverty. Um, and they got 200 people together, and so the first group of 100, they, they said food shortages in Malawi are affecting more than 3 million children, and they gave some, they gave some more general information. They told the second group of 100 um, that there was a photo of um, a 7-year-old Malawian girl called um, Rokia, and they were told specifically that her life will be changed for the better by your gift. And they said, you can give a maximum of $200 to this cause. And group two on average gave $40 more than group one. Um, so that's a fifth more out of 200. And I, I, th I think that's remarkable, that, that, that we're more willing to save an individual specific life than we are to save a statistical life. Um, and there's a case of um, some 
stupid child in Texas in 1987 who fell down a dry well um, and had to be rescued over a period of 60 hours, so, so two and a half days. And CNN, CNN took the liberty to um, beam and broadcast these photos um, and videos around the globe, and people started seeing them. And by the time Jessica McClure was lifted out of this dry well in Texas, she had um, a $2 million trust fund through donations worldwide. Now, in those um, 60 hours, according to UNICEF, 10 million children die each year. 67,500 um, children died because of causes related to poverty. And so it was completely obvious to everybody who watched CNN and read the newspapers that Jessica McClure was in danger. Um, and what is the overt difference between the cases is, is firstly the one that's given media attention and one wasn't, and secondly the response that it received, um, which, which I think represents a fairly strong example of, of priorities in the wrong case, in, in, in the wrong place. The second reason is parochialism, which es essentially means a fierce narrow-mindedness on, on, on your local area. And I, and I won't comment on, on how logical this is, because in some cases it is quite logical to be um, concerned about your local area, because it affects you more. But on the other hand, there's a, a philosophical moral case of being bothered about everybody. And Adam Smith, um, the, the great economist and philosopher, um, asks his readers um, in The Wealth of Nations, what would happen if the great emperor of China with all his myriads of inhabitants, was suddenly swallowed up by an earthquake. And he argues that a Western man of humanity would pursue his business or his pleasure, take his repose or his diversion with the same ease and tranquility as if no such accident had happened. And you may be thinking, well, you know, of, of course I would have. But let me ask you this. If the 2004 earthquake, uh, um, uh, Boxing Day Tsunami, had... Um, were to hit again tomorrow, would you drastically change your daily routine to um, think about that, to start to help the victim? Um, uh, would it weigh on your mind all day? Would you feel awful all day? Because I would argue that you wouldn't. You might return to your routine after about five minutes after telling your parents or your friends and just go to school and perhaps talk about it a bit more, express how bad, it, you know, express your feelings about how bad it was. But it wouldn't really affect your day, I don't think. And this is really what must have happened in America, because the Boxing Day tsunami killed 220,000 people and rendered millions homeless and destitute. And Americans, the most generous, the most charitable nation on earth, gave $1.5 billion for disaster relief work. The following year, Hurricane Katrina hit Florida um, and killed 1,600 people, rendered fewer than 10,000 um, uh, homeless and destitute. The American government was far more capable than in the Indonesian governments uh, uh, helping them out, and these people had insurance. Americans gave um, $6.5 billion for disaster relief work. That's over four times more. Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on, on how logical it is, again, because it, you can have such a big debate about it for, for, for the reasons I explained earlier. But that, 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 that is the reality, I think, of Western development nowadays or Western perception of development. And there's actually a discussion, um, quite an interesting one, we can have about parochialism um, between really, well, in, in history, between Victorian times and between 2000, which is the, the apotheosis, that is the highest point of globalisation, its first peak, uh, which economists will know brought about by the digitalisation of money, old Soviet regimes becoming capitalists, that sort of thing. And, and, and back in, say, the, the early Victorian times, um, it was perfectly logical to be parochial because you didn't know what was happening in the rest of the world. And if you d even if you did know what was happening, th th there was no way that you could help them. Um, I mean, and if you wanted to help people in poverty, then why not help the millions of people who were impoverished in England at that time who couldn't find work? And a perfect example of it, if, if you've read it, is Bleak House by Dickens, where there's a, uh, there, there's a character called Mrs. Jellyby who um, helps um, a a tribe um, on, the re on the left bank of the river Niger and leaves her house neglected, her husband unloved and her children unmothered. And the narrator, Dickens, ridicules her telescopic philanthropy um, and, and says that she, she can see nothing nearer than Africa. Because it was absolutely logical to focus on your home environment because you couldn't even help people um, who, who were far away, you know, let alone know that they needed any help. And a hundred years earlier, um, 
Adam Smith, I don't know, even said that this state of affairs seems wisely ordered by nature, since those far from us are people who we can neither serve nor hurt. I, I, I think that's quite interesting that um, perspectives have changed so much. Nowadays, we're in a better position to help. Um, we know far more about how we need to help, and yet we still don't. And I, again, again, it's a case of priorities in the wrong place. It's not misinformation. It's simply a case of um, being parochial and being too focused on a home environment. The third reason I'm going to put you is futility. Um, people were told in, in a sociological survey that there were several thousand refugees at risk in a camp in Rwanda. And they asked how willing they were to send aid that would save the lives of 1,500 of them. And researchers varied the number of people at risk. Um, and it transpired that people were more willing to send aid to, say, 1,500 out of 3,000 than they were to send aid to 1,500 out of 10 million. Um, even though it's entirely illogical, um, the alleviation of suffering is exactly the same. Um, and it leads us to a developmental axiom that the smaller the proportion at risk who can be saved, the less willing people are to send aid, which, I, again, I, I, I think is quite interesting. And then there are two other reasons, um, which um, are also, also equally interesting, which I don't have time to talk about them, um, in, in any depth. The diffusion of responsibility um, in terms of development. That there are other four billion, um, there are four billion other rich, rich people in the world. Well, why should I have to be one of the ones that help, that that, that, help, that helps out the developing world? And there, there, there was a case in the 1990s or early 2000s. Um, of Kitty Genovese um, in New York City, who was br brutally raped and I think murdered. Um, and when they were trying to find out what happened at the inquest, um, the coroner actually found that 38 separate people had watched or heard this happen. It's just all of them had thought that other people would act. Um, and that in American law is, um, is, is a due reason um, not for acting it, and they were protected under legislation. But it's just this idea of a diffusion of responsibility that generally people will not act if they think that um, other people are going to act for them. Also, also there's a sense of fairness. Uh, I mean, the fair share fancy. I imagine that you're on 30 grand a year um, and you decide to give away 15 grand to um, a, a homeless charity for Zimbabwe and children, say. Um, and, you, and your next door neighbour, who's also on 30 grand a year, um, comes home from his 15 grand holiday to the Caribbean with a nice tan. Um, he's also got quite a pretty wife who's attracted to his money. Um, you know, it's, it's this sort of petty jealousy um, or, just, or just viewing people who are in your frame of reference that, that may change your mind about giving money to charity. So what's the solutions? I mean, I'm mean, hopelessly vague here because it's, it's, it's really the only way that um, I, I, I can offer a solution of my own, and, and that's to look to custom and convention, which are hopelessly indeterminate and, um, and unquantifiable. But, but basically, we need to build up a culture whereby 25% or 50% of income is um, sent to third world countries, to peripheral developing countries, to help them develop um, and elevate themselves at long last to um, cast off the shackles of historical poverty. Um, and, and, it, and it can be done, it's, but, but, but it is hopelessly vague. For example, Chris Ellinger was a, was a stockbroker, um, an unsuccessful stockbroker in, in the 2000s in New York, um, in, in a loss of debt. And he was left $250,000 by his grandmother, which in the grand scheme of things is not a lot of money to be left in inheritance. Um, and, and he invested there and he started making a bit more money. And he became a philanthropist, that is a person who gives a lot, who, who, who helps out the poor a lot. And, he said, and he, he was at a conference for philanthropists, and a, la a lady asked, um, is, is there anybody who's willing to give um, more than 50% of their wealth away and their income every year away? And Chris Ellinger and a few other people put their hands up, and, they, and basically they, they formed this thing that they could call, call the 50% league, and they started giving away greater and greater proportions of their cash. Um, so, 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 so it can be done. To, provided you have the support um, and, and, and the responsibility really to do it. So that's one of my solutions. Now, we, we move on to um, the less modern side of development economics, which is what we call traditional or classical development economics, which is 
as I said, probably going to be more useful for those who, who want to do it at university or combine it with politics. Um, and, and, and this is the model that we use in development economics. Um, it's called the World System Theory Model. Um, and what, and what, we, what we'll hopefully be doing is, is going through its limitations, um, how we can adapt it to modern usage. Um, and I'll be putting to you a few ideas of my own about um, perhaps new scenarios that it, that it might fit. So basically what we're trying to do is fit the world's countries into three groups, core countries, semi-peripheral countries, and peripheral countries. Now core countries are countries that have been developed and industrialised for a long time, like Britain, the UK, um, Britain, the, the, the USA, France, the Netherlands, Germany, to some extent Russia. Um, and that they generally control and exert, exert some sort of political or economic influence over the semi-peripheral countries and the peripheral countries. Um, semi-peripheral, well it would be easier if I knew peripheral because semi-peripheral is just a mixture of core and peripheral. Peripheral countries are countries like um, um, sub-Saharan African countries, lots of countries in South America who are very undeveloped economically. Um, so perhaps they're very dependent on core countries, that is their development can only be as a reflection of um, a core country's expansion which happened in Peru. Um, and especially in Brazil in the 1960s, which we'll go into later when we talk specifically about dependency theory. Um, and then semi-peripheral countries are basically a mixture of the two. Now, th th there are a few problems with this system. Firstly, that th there are categorization errors. Um, would anybody like to suggest where we put China um, in this mix? Semi. Semi. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Possibly. I'd probably say the periphery, but the upper sort of national uh, China would be perhaps core, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, 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 possibly. Um, I, I think there's, uh, there, there are decent arguments for it being in all three. Um, it's a core country, it, it must be a core country um, uh, 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 on, on one level, because it lends the West practically all the money that it uses to buy Chinese goods and it sells them to them as well. So it's got such an important role in the world economy that um, it, you, you can't really say that it's not a core economy. Um, also, it's peripheral, though. Um, how, how many other countries have you heard of that, that have 100 million agrarian peasants um, living in absolute poverty of under one dollar a day? That's why it was so expanded um, and spread eagled on that map at the beginning. And then, and then semi-peripheral because it is to some extent making a transition. It's not totally in poverty, but it's not totally successful either. I mean, um, there are um, elements of China that are moving more towards its brain than its brawn. Why have Oxford University, Nottingham University, Cambridge University put departments in China? It's because there are far more people willing in China um, to put effort into their university studies. So. We do experience categorization errors when looking at it. I mean, I, I've, I, I saw yesterday that China overtook the USA in terms of world trade. It, it traded $3.87 trillion on its um, exchanges last year, which is huge. Um, and uh, in the next decade, Germany will uh, tr trade more with China than it will with every other part of the world. Um, so th th those are things to look out for. But politically, it's, 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 it's probably only a semi-peripheral country, um, which is quite interesting because usually it's very difficult to divorce um, the development economics and development politics, but I think there's a, a fairly solid case for it being a semi-peripheral country politically. Um, a new area that, that, that we might see this model moving into, I think, is, is the Eurozone. Um, a lot of literature nowadays puts the Eurozone crisis in terms of peripheral economies and in terms of core countries. So core countries, main, mainly Germany is the linchpin of the Eurozone, but also you have France um, and the Netherlands who are also economic powerhouses. Um, and the, the reason why we can refer to countries like Greece, Spain and Portugal as peripheral Eurozone economies, e even though they're not plagued with poverty, is because that there's a relationship of dependence between core Eurozone economies and peripheral Eurozone economies. And what I mean by that is that Germany and France own about 40% of debt in, um, in Greece, um, in Spain, in Portugal, and in Ireland. Who sets the fiscal constraints for Greece? It's Germany, probably quite fairly, because um, uh, obviously German taxpayers foot the bill um, eventually for Greek profligacy. But 
all I'm saying is I think there is some sense of dependence and of a core periphery distinction in the system. World system theory, um, down the bottom, coined by Emmanuel Wallerstein, a, ver a very important Marxist in terms of development economics. And the important thing to realize is that it's a social system as well as an, an economic system. So that, so that is culture is exported um, and transferred around the system. So that, so that means that things are fashionable in the core eventually become fashion in the semi periphery and the periphery, where the poor should do most of their business now. Um, over 80% of their sales come from China. Um, why um, is Laos and Cambodia, um, why are Laos and Cambodia the biggest buyers of Kalashnikovs and rifles now? It's because they saw how effective they were at deterring the Americans in, in Vietnam. So you can export weapons, you can export fashion labels, mobile phones, um, all, 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 all these things due to the world system. Um, it, it, it may be useful to look, look at how development has changed in terms of physical development. Um, earlier, well, well, in history, um, it, if you look at it in a very cynical way, Britain was able to develop because it went to Africa and India and said, well, we like the look of these resources. We don't care that, that you've had them for a while. Um, uh, we don't really mind that we're destroying a thousand years of your heritage. You can have some railways after we're gone, um, and we're going to take this bit of land. That, that's why if you look at a map of Africa, it's got so many straight lines in it. It's because Britain and France and Germany have literally said, we quite fancy this area here, when can we get us it? Um, so they de developed through colonies, um, and Br Brazil and China are, tr are trying this at the moment, but they've realised that, it's quite a, that co co colonies are quite... A, a contingent episode in, in history that, 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 that is you need certain factors at play. So what they've what they had to do is develop in a totally different way which is why we see the categorization of bricks is because they are newly industrializing nations um, who have the potential to overtake the USA and obviously I've presented one statistic that suggests that China has already overtaken the USA um, is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa for those of you who don't know. There are also two other main categorizations of nations. Below BRICS, you have the next 11 nations, um, as defined by Goldman Sachs, um, Bangladesh, Egypt, um, Iran, Indonesia, Pakistan, Turkey, South Korea, probably the most important ones there, the ones who can take up BRICS status in the future. And also the three G nations that are mostly um, an amalgamation of BRICS nations and, uh, and next 11 nations who are identified for their likely return on investment um, in this decade. So that slide is just focusing on how, um, how different countries have developed at different times um, and why. Now in terms of schools of development thought, um, it, fr from 1930 to present, there, there, there are two major schools of thought that if you want to grapple with development economics, um, you, you have to get to understand these. Um, and one is dependency theory and one is neostructural economics. Dependency theory is indigenous to Latin America. That is, Latin America experienced dependency to the greatest extent, and therefore their theorists have to try and solve it. Um, so, so a lot of dependency literature is, is based on our Argentinian, Chilean, and our Brazilian economics. Um, and that's from about 1930 to 1990. And then the structural economics is from 1990 to present. Um, it's proven to be very successful at all. Very, very quickly, the um, dependency theory is um, the theory that smaller peripheral countries can only expand as a reflection of um, core countries' expansion. Um, that is, that they've penetrated those countries so deeply that there's no, there's no hope for them to expand on their own. Uh, an example of that is um, in the 1960s, America eventually bought up basically 100% of Peru's industry. Um, so it, it could only expand when America um, increased its demand for Brazil's uh, for Peru's products. Um, also, Brazil was very dependent on America for oil. It was 100% dependent on America for oil, which you can imagine is a pretty forlorn economic situation to be in. So, so, so what they did was they sent out in 1962 all of their oil tankers and, and, and they filled them up in American ports um, and they made sure that they were all out to sea and then they wrote off their debt to the Americans, um, which gave them about a month to 
um, get, get back on their feet and start extracting oil for themselves, which they, which they did do, it's incredible. Um, and then from about 1990, we see neo-structural economics coming out as a, as a, as a, as a main school of development thought, which is, which is saying, well the, well, the government in a country has to act to sever ties of dependence, but then it also has to say, well, we're going to sit back and let the markets do their work so that, um, so, so that basically normal economic forces can be at play in, in, in a certain country. Um, and it's, it's commonly associated with the example of Brazil moving towards higher intelligence quotients. So um, at Greenwich University, for example, um, one province out of 4,000 in Brazil um, has sent 60 PhD students to study uh, engineering and maths. So, so one province out of 4,000 in Brazil sending 60 students to one Western university is, is incredible, and they're all PhD students as well, in, implying that they have prior university education elsewhere. We'll leave development in Marxism because it can get complicated. Um, and then if, if you consider that neo-structural economics came in in 1990, you can see the changes for yourself in a Gini coefficient reduction of amount. Um, 0.08, which is huge in 20 years, uh, the Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality. And, and then obviously the, the reduction in the percentage of the population below the poverty line, it, you can see for yourself it's from about 43% down to 21% in 20 years, which I, I think is the quickest race in the world, um, apart from China. But obviously China still has its 100 million um, agrarian peasants in poverty. So, so, so the last thing I'm really going to cover is this question of an initial rapid expansion. Um, and, and, and it's a thing that confuses some people because um, it, it's not logical that, that not all countries should go through a period of expansion. I mean, I, I, I put the question up on the board, surely all countries go through this and, it's, yeah, and that's just a springboard, uh, a springboard to further development. Um, I'm, I'm going to put to you three reasons, and I'm going to leave out the bottom one for now, why this doesn't happen. The least important reasons are it is um, the presence of kleptocracies. That, 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 that is states that steal um, aid from the people. Um, the most famous example of this is aid in Somalia, whereby um, I think about $3 billion worth of American aid went to them. Um, and I think only about $2,000 reached them because it was hijacked along the way through uh, by um, um, and, and eventually used on um, arms to fight the Americans, um, which is uh, which seems paradoxical. Then we also have incapable governance. Now, in um, the UK, we're just used to our Oxbridge graduates filling up the treasury on on quite high salaries, and and that's all well and good because we've got 200 years of economic knowledge and, and university education behind us, and but. Once you get into the third world, you, you, you literally don't have that level of expertise. Um, you know, you don't have people that have been to Oxbridge mostly, or, or you certainly don't have people who have been to Oxbridge and then want to go back um, to um, the country which they suffered in, in incredible poverty under. Um, so what tends to happen is that organisations like the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, um, and, and the World Bank come up and say, well, we're, we're going to give you some money. Um, but we're going to tell you exactly how to spend it, we're going to tell you what to spend it on, and then we're, going, we're, we're not even going to tell you when the supply of money is going to stop, we're, we're going to set the limits of when the money is going to stop. And another danger with that is that nobody in the developed world, or nobody in the world, even, even voted to give billions and millions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, to the World Bank and the IMF to help out um, perhaps developing countries that they don't approve of. Um, so these organisations look for tacit consent to their existence from developing nations so they can say, well, well, well actually these nations have said they're quite pleased with us and their populations are quite pleased with us. Um, and often that isn't a concession that developing nations want to give politically because they may ruin their chances of trade and diplomacy in the future. Lastly, development is hard to initiate. I mean, I'm, 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 imagine if you were the Algerian Prime Minister Try, trying to promote for, foreign direct investment in Algeria at the moment. You'll have a conference with business leaders and they say, um, and uh, you say, well, wh wh why aren't you investing in, in, in Algeria that much? And, and, and they say, well, actually, you've got quite a strong terrorist threat in the country at the moment. Um, you know, since, um, uh, since the revolution um, that 
you've fallen back into autocracy, your oil production has fallen, you know, what really has Algeria got going for it? What, why would, why on earth would I want to live, invest in, 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 in your country? So, so, some countries at this stage in time just don't have much going for them at all. Um, and, and, and that's why um, external agencies uh, and businesses find it so hard to invest, it's because it is their money, and they, they need to find stable places to invest. That's um, a, a good note to finish on, I think. Um, what, what I've tried to do is, is present you with a methodology to, um, to or, or a lens to look at development economics through. Um, hopefully I've set up the ground for um, my second lecture, which will be specifically for those who are either doing economics at university or um, very interested in development economics, uh, where we'll look more scientifically at how dependency theory uh, and neostructural economics work, which we've kind of skated over today. Thank you very much.